Thank you very much for that warm introduction. Thanks to all of you for being here today on uh, such a lovely day outdoors and you're all in here, but it's important. Uh, it's important for the safety of our country that in 2016 uh, we elect someone who understands that his job is to be President of the United States and not Secretary General of the United Nations. And, and, and in fact, I really think that, uh, that this is the most critical decision that primary voters and caucus goers have to make and the special role that you and South Carolina have with a few other states to be able to help focus the Republican presidential nomination on the qualities we need and the objectives that we should seek and who our nominee will be. And I think without any question, although there are many important issues confronting the country, the economy, Obamacare, there's a long list of issues that we have to understand that the principal job of the President of the United States is to protect the country. The cur That's not the view of the current incumbent. I think he believes national security gets in the way of his real priority, which he told us in 2008 was to fundamentally transform the country. That's what he wants to do. And national security is a distraction from that, which is why he doesn't pay any attention to it. Uh, and I think in a nominee that the first thing that we should search for is that instinctive sense that not just at an intellectual level, not just at the level of reading a speech, but emotionally and in their hearts, the candidates know that whatever other issues are out there, their job as president, when they wake up in the morning, to have as their first thought, what threats does the United States face today? And what am I going to do to prevent them from coming into reality? That's the president's job. We have elected two times in a row an amateur, somebody who wasn't prepared to be president in 2008. And somebody who has proved that on the job training doesn't necessarily work. We can't afford to make that mistake again in 2016. And believe me, in the next two years, uh, we will face increased peril around the world because our adversaries can read the calendar just as well as we can. They don't know who will be elected in November of 2016, but they know they've got Barack Obama until then. So any adversary out there with an agenda to advance against the United States knows that this is the time to do it. So we're going to see more threats, and, and the prospect after the new president's sworn in uh, I think is even more fearsome because we've got a momentum build up around the world that's very adverse uh, to the United States. And we know that the most likely Democratic nominee for president, unless she self-destructs before then, is Hillary Clinton. Now, th this is a depressing prospect, I admit. But uh, let's be clear, although her tenure was an abject failure. It's her only ostensible qualification to be president. And say whatever you will about her, she can talk the talk when it comes to foreign policy. So in a debate, it's going to be critical for the Republican nominee to beat her soundly on an issue that should be ours. The Republican Party is the party of national security. Close quote. There, there is no national security wing of the Democratic Party anymore. If we abandon our basic principles, not only will it be bad politics for us, it will endanger the nation. With all that's going on, the level of threats we face uh, around the world is rising. And even if Hillary is not the Democratic uh, nominee, uh, her philosophy and Obama's philosophy are embedded in the Democratic Party. That's what they all think at the presidential level. And I can tell you from experience, Hillary and Bill were a year ahead of me in law school. 
I like to say I've been burdened with them 20 years longer than the rest of the country. The way a person is at that time of their life in law school or grad school or whatever, that's pretty much the way she, that you're going to turn out to be. She was a radical then and she's a radical today. She, she doesn't have to work to get to the left of Elizabeth Warren. She's already to the left of Elizabeth Warren. Uh, and you're going to see it more and more as the campaign proceeds. Her foreign policy or defense policy are indistinguishable from Barack Obama's. And the failures of his administration are her failures right across the board, starting right now with the utterly inadequate and feckless response to the continuing, indeed growing, threat of international terrorism. It is simply wrong to say, as the President continually says, that we can handle terrorism as a law enforcement matter. It's not a law enforcement matter. It's a threat on the scale of a war, which is what we understood as a country right after the 9-11 attack but which the President and the Democratic Party have done their best to try and make us forget. The fact is that Obama's policies have directly contributed to the increased threats which we see in the United States today. It was his decision to withdraw American and other coalition forces from Iraq in 2011 that caused the collapse of the effort to make Iraq into a country that gave Iran the ability to take over effectively the government in Baghdad and that therefore directly contributed to the rise of ISIS. That is where the responsibility lies. And you haven't heard Hillary Clinton say one word of criticism of the President's uh, policies in that regard. When you hear ISIS claim credit for the attacks in Garland, Texas, that particular claim may or may not be true, but as sure as we are sitting here, ISIS is training terrorists to come to this country to carry out uh, individual acts of terrorism, perhaps mass violence that uh, we can't even predict, and quite possibly with weapons of mass destruction. This threat is real, it's growing, uh, and it's something that the Obama administration uh, has completely underestimated during its entire tenure in office. The fact is that uh, the episode at Benghazi on September the 11th, 2012, is the Obama-Clinton foreign policy in operation. It was a failure. It was a failure before the attack on the consulate in Benghazi. It failed on the day of the attack, and it has failed consistently since then. Of course, Hillary doesn't want us to talk about it. Of course, she doesn't want it investigated uh, by Congressman Gowdy's committee. Of course, she doesn't want to testify, uh, because she's culpable. You know, in uh, a, a year and a half before that attack, we had to withdraw all of our personnel from Libya as Gaddafi was being overthrown. You know how we evacuated our diplomats f through the United States Navy? No. We rented a Greek ferry boat to come and pull our people out. And thank God they got out without incident. Don't you think a responsible administration would have said, this is a problem? that we could face this kind of violence again? Well, they didn't. They didn't take the steps necessary to protect Americans, and it's not just official Americans. It's uh, business people, it's tourists, it's missionaries, it's non-governmental organizations, all of whom are in jeopardy. And so by not undertaking any preparation, they set up the events of 9-11 in Benghazi, where Ambassador Stevens and three other brave Americans were killed, perhaps tortured, at least in some cases. Uh, and on that day, not only was nothing done, the response of the administration was to go home. The president left the Oval Office in the Situation Room to go to the residence. Hillary Clinton left the State Department to go home. Not once on that day did she call the Secretary of Defense to ask what we were doing. Uh, she didn't stay uh, in a way that the six secretaries of state that I've worked for would have stayed there all night if they'd had to to protect our people in danger overseas. Hillary Clinton went home. That act alone disqualifies her from being president of the United States. And 
And, and in the aftermath of the attack, the sum total of the response of the United States of America has been to arrest one, one of the people responsible and bring them back to the United States for a full due process criminal trial. What lesson does that send to the terrorists all around the world? What lesson does it send to the state sponsors who arm them and equip them and finance them? I'll tell you what it says. It says that an American ambassador who is the personal representative of the President of the United States overseas can be murdered by a group of terrorists with complete impunity. Under Barack Obama, you can kill his personal representative, and he does nothing. That's the lesson that it sends. And w will Hillary Clinton, will Hillary Clinton answer any questions about this? Oh no, especially not after her last uh, outburst when she said, "What difference does it make?" That disqualifies her from being president as well. You know, people, people have criticized Susan Rice for the nonsense she said on the five Sunday talk shows after the attack about the Mohammed video and so on. Uh, and look, I think being UN ambassador is a wonderful job. It has nothing to do with our embassy in Libya. That was the role of the Secretary of State. Where was Hillary Clinton that weekend? She didn't want to go out and answer the questions, so they sent somebody else out. She doesn't want to testify before Gong Congressman Gowdy's committee, maybe one day, maybe if it suits her purposes. Uh, I'll tell you, her unwillingness to answer the questions shows how vulnerable she understands herself to be. And as we get closer to November 2016, we are never going to let her forget that. Now, now, this list of failures is a long list, and I don't have a lot of time, so I'm just going to pick a few more highlights here. I think that the treatment uh, by Obama and by Hillary Clinton during her time as Secretary of State, their treatment of Israel is describable in one word. It is despicable, the way they have treated Israel. They have humiliated a democratically elected ally of the United States. They have treated him with disrespect. They have undermined the very legitimacy of the state of Israel. They have questioned uh, its, uh, its democratic bona fides. They have pressured it to enter into agreements with terrorist groups and with groups that can't control their own population. They have pushed it to give up vital uh, strategic uh, territory in order to create a Palestinian state that almost inevitably will be yet another terrorist state uh, in the Middle East. And they have completely disregarded Israel's legitimate fears that an Iran armed with nuclear weapons will be capable of carrying out a second, a nuclear holocaust. For all of those reasons, anybody who believes in the solidarity of the West, of which Israel is an integral part, has to reject the Obama-Clinton approach to Middle East policy and reject it emphatically because it undermines our own safety. I have had many Arab leaders say to me, when you look at how this administration has treated Israel, the question we ask ourselves is if that's the way the United States now treats its friends, how will they treat us when our time of trouble comes? The adverse effect of this kind of policy doesn't make itself simply felt on Israel. It undercuts our alliance structures all over the world, and our adversaries know it. Hillary Clinton will go down in history as the person who gave the Russian foreign minister, Sergei Lavrov, the famous reset button. And what have the Russians done in response? Good God, they've invaded the Ukraine. That's a reset, to be sure. And what's the response been? So weak, so inadequate, that we now face the prospect that Vladimir Putin will take advantage of these last two years to press the NATO alliance in the Baltic republics or elsewhere in Eastern and Central Europe. And Obama and Clinton have only themselves to blame. It was not uh, a, a critic of the administration. It was Barack Obama himself who told then-President Medvedev you tell Vladimir that I'll be more flexible once the election is over. You better believe it. 
And the Russians have taken it to heart, the Chinese have taken it to heart in East Asia. We see aggressive, uh, near belligerent Chinese territorial claims in the East China Sea. We see China building a blue water navy literally for the first time in 600 years. There was just a headline in the newspapers earlier this week that China and Russia are going to conduct joint naval maneuvers in the Mediterranean Sea. That's a long way from China, but it's showing what their reach is. All across uh, the, the Middle East, we see structures that have been in place, state structures since World War I, dissolving. We've gone from the Middle East being a crisis in this country, a crisis in that country, to uh, a region slipping into chaos. Libya, we know, is in chaos. Nigeria, we see Boko Haram uh, dismembering the state in northern Nigeria, attacking in Cameroon and Niger. Somalia hasn't had a government in 25 years. The Sinai Peninsula is out of control of the Egyptian military. Yemen has collapsed as a country and has the dubious distinction of hosting all three of Al-Qaeda in the Arabian Peninsula, a branch of ISIS, and the Houthi coalition, a surrogate for the Ayatollahs in Tehran. Iraq and Syria have ceased to exist as states. Kurds are out of it in Iraq. ISIS has created a new Sunni state out of the western third of Iraq and the eastern two-thirds of Syria. It will be a magnet for international terrorism. Uh, and we're standing by while it happens. You know, Winston Churchill, faced with the Russian Revolution, once said we should have strangled Bolshevism in its cradle. Uh, we should have strangled ISIS in its cradle too, but now, now they control. They control territory the size of Great Britain. And the biggest problem of all, the Iranian nuclear weapons program, is proceeding along uh, with no impediments whatever. You know, there's a lot of talk now about congressional oversight over the deal that Obama is going to sign. I have to tell you, it's fundamentally irrelevant. If this deal is signed by Obama and approved by Congress, Iran will get nuclear weapons. If it's not signed or it's not approved by Congress, Iran will get nuclear weapons. These negotiations themselves have given Iran a legitimacy politically and in terms of its uranium enrichment program that are very hard to stop. And it won't end with Iran with nuclear weapons. The Saudis, the Egyptians, the Turks, and others will get nuclear weapons, and the prospect of a nuclear war in the already volatile Middle East will rise dramatically. The failure of the United States to stop the Iranian nuclear weapons program now turns the spotlight on Israel. I don't know what they'll do, but I do know this. Sometime in the next two years, maybe a little bit later, uh, we'll see if for the third time in its history, Israel attacks a nuclear weapons program in the hands of a hostile state. I think the United States position should be very clear if Israel does this. That we should say immediately this was a legitimate exercise by Israel of its inherent right to self-defense and we will support them every way we can. Now, let's, let's talk a little bit about what must be done, what a new president must do thinking about the, tr the transition between Jimmy Carter, uh, whom we can now look back on as a tough-minded president compared to the one we've got in office now, and Ronald Reagan, who we can say with confidence won the Cold War. We need a new president who will immediately reassert American political leadership around the world, who will say the principles that Reagan espoused of peace through strength are back and the United States is no longer going to lead from behind or anywhere else but from the front. This is, this is absolutely critical to restoring whatever minimal order and stability there is, and it has to be coupled with something else. We cannot blink. We need a massive increase in the Defense Department budget that the Obama administration has eviscerated over the past six years. There are a lot of competing pressures. People are worried about expenditures and the, and the national debt, and they should be. I think there's a relatively easy answer. Why don't we just cut domestic expenditures back to where they were in 2008? That was not exactly a time of austerity. 
And that, and that will pay for the military budget increase. And we need a president who understands that America is a benign and strong force in the world, that American strength does not provoke animosity, that what endangers our country is American weakness. A Republican president can fix every mistake Barack Obama has made. Thank you very much.